Welcome back inside the den. Hey, it's game week. You know, we've been waiting weeks and weeks and weeks and months um, just for football season to get back. And it's an exciting time, Chris, uh, under the Jeff, uh, Jeff Cho era, um, kind of opening up this weekend against SMU. Uh, what are you looking forward to at that game? Just to see how they play. I mean, we've been to probably 40 practices at this point. And Nevada, if you throw in the player-led practices, have probably had like 70 practices leading up to this moment. Jeff Cho hired almost to this day eight months ago. So, like, let's see where this program is under him. And obviously, it's a very difficult test. You're talking about an SMU team that won 11 games last year. They return a ton of talent. They added a ton of really good transfers. They're moving into the uh, ACC, a lot of momentum. This is a fringe top 25 team. Would not be shocked if they're in the top 25 by the end of the season. So it's obviously a difficult test, but I want to see how this team fares against one of the better teams in the country. I don't think many people expect them to win. They're a 27-point underdog, but – you know, will they show some growth? Will the offense have some um, explosive plays? Will the defense be able to cauterize if they make a mistake or two? Will they kind of wilt like we've seen in previous years? Can this team be competitive at home with a lot of energy against one of the best teams in the country? So there's a lot to look forward to, and this is what you work for. These now 13 opportunities this year. I want to see how Nevada does in one of these opportunities. I don't think um, if they lose that, you know, you should sound any alarm bells, but – um, I think we're going to learn a ton about this team uh, Saturday at 5 p.m., way more than we've learned during practice. You can only learn so much when you're playing against yourself. This is a, a different level, a different challenge against a different um, you know, caliber of opponent than you know, playing inner squad scrimmages. So I'm just really excited to see if you know, what Jeff Choch has, has been preaching takes hold with this team. Yeah, they'll be interesting. Obviously, a really talented team. Uh, finished last year as the 22nd ranked team in the nation. Um, did have their struggles against Power 5 opponents, but, you know, nonetheless, you take a look at that roster and littered with talent. Um, so, you know, a lot of, uh, you know, taking a step back, just looking at the, the you know, the two depth charts, and you're like, oh, okay, this is kind of <laughs> lopsided. But, you know, they, I don't think the, the players are taking it lightly. Um, we had actually an opportunity to catch up with a lot of the players this week. Let's go ahead and toss to that sound. I, it just feels like a new energy. I know the past two years haven't been the best, and I've been a part of that, and this just feels different. I know we just got a lot of different moxie to us, uh, and that comes from the top down with Coach Cho. He, he comes with a different presence, and I think – that it feeds into us a lot. And I think we're more confident in ourselves than we have been in the past because of those two and 10 seasons. We kind of just forgot about that two and 10. It still scars us, but we kind of forgot about it and we feel like a new team. Why do you think you guys have that belief? Uh, I think it comes from the players like me who have actually felt that two and 10. Like we felt the losses and we don't want to feel that anymore. And we feel like we got the pieces and the pieces Coach Trost brought in, they can help us in some of those missing errors we didn't have last year. Yeah, so I uh, played a lot of ball, so I, done a lot of living and learning and I see guys and their the, their mental preparation for the game and just being prepared pre-snap so I just took that and wanted to implement it in my game uh, it's, I felt like that was an area I could do more so I really did that like got extra time anytime I can get with the coaches and watch extra film I wanted to do that even if it was just by myself I know doing it by myself is going to make me better and uh, help help my teammates get better so I tried to pull a couple guys in there with me so we can all be on the same page because at the end of the day if we're all on the same page we're going to do better executing on the field. So that was my, my, my biggest goal. How Just, much more prepared do you feel then with all that extra work you put in? I feel a lot more prepared. Like it is really helpful. Like just knowing, like just figuring out where to go with the ball on time, knowing, knowing what the defense is in pre-snap and that all just comes with preparation and film and just studying and studying and studying. So that was just a big emphasis in my off season. And I feel like it really helped with my sp speed of the game on the field. Uh, I think it's a, a full team effort, to be honest. I mean, uh, everybody speaks about the D-line, and D-line is really good, but they had DBs that made plays when they needed to be made. So it'll be a challenge for sure. I don't think they're pushovers in any way, shape, or form. But I think uh, our matchups, we like them, and I'm sure they probably like theirs on the other end, but we won't know until we line up and play. There's a lot of talk about how good of a passing offense this is, but they also run the ball really well as well. How would you describe the balance this offense has? Uh, as our coaches describe it, they're very balanced. Uh, they do run the ball and they pass the ball really, really well. But when we lock into our details, we figure that we actually have a chance and, and have a chance to stop them. So that's what we're really focused on right now is dialing into our details, focus on the plays, focus on our assignments and executing. And Chris, yeah, we talked to a lot of those players, as you heard. They don't lack in confidence. I, one thing that stood out was uh, uh, Brendan Lewis kind of talking about, you know, just being more attentive and, uh, you know, more disciplined with his study. Uh, and that has led to, you know, him, you know, what should be uh, his, his better, you know, a better year for the, for the player. Mm -hmm. um, but 
yeah, it's kind of it's intriguing that you know, <laughs> before he didn't study, and now you know, Chuck Choke comes in, and uh, you know, he's he's uh, chopping I, it up. I'm sure someone. he studied a little, <laughs> but I mean, there seems to be a lot more maturity in Brendan yeah. Lewis. I mean, he got engaged in the off season. This is his fifth year of college. He kind of has to know, like, if it doesn't happen this year, it's not happening. Um, you know, he's six and nineteen career as a starter turn, uh, during his time at Colorado and Nevada. He's basically had two full seasons as a starting quarterback. Two thousand twenty-one at Colorado went four and eight, and then last year at Nevada they went two and ten. So he's got to prove he can be a winner to get a chance at the next level. So got year, two years of eligibility left. So I think you're going to see a much better Brendan Lewis. I think he's got better support cast. I think he obviously has put more work into it. I think he's got a better coaching staff, a more experienced coaching staff. I mean, Coach Matt Lubick, the offensive coordinator, um, has been, you know, this is 30th year in the game, whereas Derek Sage last year had never been a coordinator before he came to Nevada. Still a very good coach, just a different level of expertise at that offensive coordinator position. So you talk to the guys, you watch practice, um, you know, we're unbiased, but I was watching them and, you know, talking to them. And you're like, oh, I got some confidence that this team might be able to keep it somewhat close against SMU. Maybe it can be a single digit game at home. And then I looked at SMU's depth chart and I looked mm -hmm. at everybody that they return. Their top two passers, their top three rushers, their top seven pass catchers, their top seven guys in tackles from an 11 win team that went undefeated in the AAC and probably should have been in a New Year's Six Bowl. Like, this team is super loaded, and even the positions where they lost some guys, like on the defensive line, they added two transfers from Miami who have a combined 52 tackles for loss in their career and 21 sacks. They added a nose guard from Arkansas who's 350 pounds. Outside of cornerback, I don't see a lot of areas on this team where they're a little bit weak, maybe offensive tackle as well as they move their best tackle to center. This is a really good team, and I think mm – -hmm. That maybe changes Jeff Choate's approach to this game, as we kind of talked about in the press conference with him Monday. I mean, he even kind of said, you know, he's not going to look at the scoreboard to kind of determine how Nevada fared in this game. It's going to be a little bit more, how did they fight adversity? How did they stick together? Did they execute to the best of their abilities? Because I think Nevada could play a good game and still lose this one by two touchdowns. That's just how good and cohesive SMU is, bringing back a lot of guys from last year. So I think that optimism I had that Nevada might keep this one close it started to peter out as I looked into SMU a little yeah, bit more. Yeah, and you mentioned that Jeff Choate sound. Let's go ahead and play that for you guys at home. Uh, yeah, here it is. Well, I think this. I think I want to. I mean, really, I want our program to be defined by two words: toughness and discipline. Those are the two things that I want this program to be about. And if uh, if us, and I'm not just talking about physical toughness, being able to take an emotional blow and respond quickly in an appropriate fashion, being resilient, right? And uh, I think that's something that, you know, when you have a program that's struggled, as we have over the last couple of years, that's the first thing that's going to be, that's the first chink in the armor, that here we go again mentality. Like, I don't care. I really don't care what the scoreboard says at the end of this game. The only thing I care about is how we play, how we represent the University of Nevada, how hard we play, how disciplined we play, showing resilience and mental toughness and then physically getting after it. That's the only thing that matters, you know. And if we, if we feel good about the effort, the toughness and the discipline that we played with, then we'll grow from there. And that's the objective. And yeah, kind of shocking there, uh, Chris, just to hear that. Uh, obviously on the service, you're like, oh, is he already packing it in? But honestly, he probably just wants to get the most out of his players to play hard. He knows the writing on the wall. This is a really talented team coming in. Probably not expecting to beat them, but he wants them to show some fight. SMU top 11 in the nation last year in scoring offense and scoring defense. And I think you're going to grade this game on a curve. You see a lot of Nevada's first-year head coaches, they have to play against really good competition. Brian Polian's first game was at UCLA, a 10-win team, top 25 in the nation. Um, you go before that, Chris Tormey, his first game was at Oregon, 11-win team, finished top 10 in the nation. Uh, you look at Jeff Horton, he played his first game at Wisconsin. They lost only one game that, late, that year, top five in the nation. So a lot of times, a first-year, first-time Nevada head coach, they kind of have to go against this huge team. And SMU is kind of that team, although this game is at home, and those ones are on the road. So, um, you know, I think Jeff Cho's going to understand, he's been around long enough, that whether Nevada played well or played poorly is not going to be completely dictated by the scoreboard. Obviously, the scoreboard is the only thing that matters at the end. But I think this whole season, that's going to kind of be the story. Because Nevada's playing a very difficult schedule. They're playing 10 bowl teams out of 13 games. They're playing the top five teams in the Mountain West preseason poll, only seven conference games. They got the far, five hardest teams. Like, 
there can be progress with this team and they could end up with four wins. And on the surface, people might say four and nine. That was a terrible season. It might not be that. You have to watch the game a little bit closer to figure out did they play well or did they play poorly and not to make excuses before the season even begins. But I do think you could see progress and from a win-loss perspective might not be blown away. Now we'll have to watch the games and see what happens. But um, this is a very difficult opponent because SMU has an awesome offense. Um, I think some people might say it's a pass-first offense. They actually run Mm -hmm. the ball 54% of the time. So they're pretty balanced. They're very explosive. They were top five in the nation last year in offensive plays per game, more than 70. They play really fast. I think when you're in your first game, you're not fully conditioned. So I think that Mm -hmm. will be a challenge for Nevada. Um, They do get the ball down the field really, really well. And the Wolfpack was prone to giving up big plays last year. Um, And then you look at their defense. Their defensive line is gigantic. Mm -hmm. So Nevada wants to run the ball. How are you going to do that against, as we said, three of their four starters on the defensive line are transfers from Miami. One of them was at SMU last year, and he was an All-American. And then they added a 350-pound nose guard from Arkansas. So you got huge bodies up front. Will Nevada's offensive line be able to get a push against SMU? Because they're going to have to run the ball, shrink the clock, shrink the number of possessions, get a couple turnovers, make a couple big plays in special teams. And we haven't even mentioned, mentioned special teams for SMU, but they've got a guy who averaged almost 30 yards per uh, return last year and kick return with a touchdown, and a guy who averaged 11 yards per return in the punt game with a touchdown. Mm-hmm. This is a super well-rounded team. So um, this is the best team Nevada will play all season. So it, it's, yeah. a, it's a very interesting challenge right out of the gate. Yeah, you and I were talking earlier and uh, kind of mentioning the ACC. You know, this team could very well, outside of Florida State, could very well end up representing that conference uh, in the, the 12-man playoff. Now we don't know how, how the season is going to roll out, but they certainly have the talent. I mean, look at the – they're returning all these starters on offense, and last year they had 542 points for, which ranked eighth in the FBS. That's, you know, that's, that's crazy. Um, but their uh, quarterback, uh, pay, uh, Preston, Preston, Stone. Preston Stone, is a uh, talented uh, kid, you know, and, and missed the bowl game last year, but really talented, mm-hmm. can extend the play, um, which adds more stress to your defense, right? If, if they're already going to have success or, you know, theoretically should have success on the ground and you do get those chances of, of forcing a third and long, then you have to compete with a, a quarterback that can extend the play uh, on top of receivers that they have that you know are deep threats. Most notably, uh, Jalen Knighton, mm-hmm. uh, a really good player that led them in receiving last year, um, but a prolific deep threat. Um, so, yeah, it's a tall task for the Nevada defense. But yeah, it's you know, you gotta show some fight. Uh, you might not see an offense like this again uh, this season, but you know, it's it should be a challenge on Saturday. SMU is actually gonna probably play two quarterbacks in this game. You have Preston Stone. You also have Kevin Jennings. He played in the uh, AAC championship game because Stone was hurt. They won that game, and then mm-hmm. he started the bowl game as well. So he started the last couple of games due to injury. Stone is back. He's healthy. He's gonna start. Um, but it sounds like they're gonna play multiple quarterbacks in this game. Obviously, the score may dictate that. Um, but th- yeah, this team's really deep all across the board. I mean, they've got probably four running backs who could start at most Mountain West schools. Um, they've got a really good wide receiver group. There isn't like one guy who gets like 80 catches. They spread it out. Um, they've got a really good tight end, one of the best tight ends in the nation. They got an experienced offensive line, almost 100 combined starts. Now the majority of that is on the interior. Mm-hmm. I would say the weakness is that tackle. So can Nevada get into some pass rushing situations, try and heat him up with Henry Kahihifo, Caden Johnson, get him in like third and six or longer yeah. and try and take advantage of those tackles. That'll be an interesting question mark. Um, you look at middle linebacker, they've got three really high level middle linebackers. Um, you look at the defensive line, as we mentioned, really big guys, really productive guys. You look at safety, they're very deep there. I think they got four really good safeties. I would say cornerback is a bit of a weakness as well. So, you know, Nevada, they want to run the ball, but they've got two pretty good wide receivers, Jaden Smith, Cortez uh, Braham Jr., um, Brendan Lewis, the quarterback. Can they maybe expose those cornerbacks? I think that's an area where Nevada could potentially have some success as well. They've got a third-year starting kicker. They do have a new punter, so maybe there's a weakness there. He's a transfer (laughs) from Texas, but he only has one career punt. (laughs) And then I mentioned their punt return and kickoff return game. I think that's going to be really good as well. So Nevada has to be really um, spectacular in the special teams too. So there's just not a lot of weaknesses. Usually Mm -hmm. when you're game planning, you're like, okay, we could take advantage of this or we might have an advantage in this. Um, I do a position preview every single position plus special teams plus coaching. I gave every check mark to SMU, and honestly, I don't think there was one where I could have made the case for Nevada, just yeah. in terms of returning talent and production. This is third year under um, their head coach. 
So they've got some continuity. That's, uh, Red Lashley. Yeah, so he comes from the Gus Malzahn mm-hmm. tree. Yep. Um, you know, he uh, played at Arkansas, was a, a quarterback himself, was a very good quarterback at high school, had some injuries, and then, you know, wasn't able to necessarily start at the college level. But he's a younger guy in his early 40s. Would not be surprised if they have a great season that he gets to, like, a top 25 kind of school. But maybe he says SMU is that place. Uh, you know, they paid a lot of money to get into the ACC. Yep. They got a lot of money for NIL, which you see with donors. some of these transfers. Mm-hmm. Um, so this is a program that's being funded at a high level. They're yep. being coached at a high level, and they have players who play at a high level. So, uh, yeah, I mean, kind of talking about them, you make it sound like it's insurmountable, but <laughs> it's a football game, right? And yeah. it's the first football game of the season. Yeah. And they don't have tape on what Nevada does. So that's an sure. advantage, Band I think, for the Wolfpack. There's nothing – I mean, are they going to go back and watch the Montana State film from 2019 when Jeff Joe was coaching? Probably not. I think the defense will look similar, but they've got a different offensive coordinator in Matt Lubick than what he had at Montana State. I think it's going to be a little bit more pass-oriented than what he did at Montana State, running the ball 65% of the time. I think they're going to throw the ball uh, a touch more. It's still going to be a run-first offense. Um, And there's just a lot of new pieces for Nevada as well. You're talking about like 60 new players since Jeff Choate took over. So um, I guess if there's some advantage, you're at home, you have the altitude. Mm -hmm. You have the you know first game of the season, so they're not going to be fully conditioned to maybe play at their tempo. Mm-hmm. Um, but more so than anything, it's just there is an unknown and uncertainty as you're game planning to play Nevada because you haven't seen what they do because this is a new staff. Right. I mean, they, on one hand, yeah, next week's matchup with Troy, then they start to collect that that film. Mm-hmm. Obviously, it changes throughout the season, but it's a large unknown. Um, but if you were to think of a perfect game plan or script that Nevada could use to potentially make it closer, put some pressure on SMU, it would be to get off the field on defense, you know, don't let the the up-tempo offense get rolling. And that's usually getting those one, two first downs, then it's hard to compete because it's just down your throat and really fast, you know, just get to the ball and snap, get to the ball and snap. And once you're in that situation, it's just hard to stop as, an, as a defense. Um, so if they can do that and play kind of keep away from that, that SMU offense and – you know, to have long drives, milking the clock, and you know, capitalizing on when you're in the in the red zone to get touchdowns. Um, obviously, that's a perfect game plan, perfect script, um, but it's probably not going to happen like that. Um, just with how talented this team is, um, but if they could show some fight. Obviously, that is desirable. Um, Cho did mention earlier in the offseason that he views the out of conference much like a preseason because uh, the real season gets here when Mountain West play. Uh, arrives because by no means does Cho expect this team to be in the college football playoff. Uh, he knows. Yeah, that. not in year one. <clears throat> uh, I don't think, yeah, that's probably not happening. But yeah, I mean, if you look at the game plan, so there's a running clock yep. this year in college football. It's more um, like the NFL, whereas mm-hmm. before it would stop at every first down. So the game would go a little bit longer. That's probably one less possession per game. Yep. Um, so if Nevada's running the ball and like milking the clock, as you mentioned, mm-hmm. you can do that a little bit more with that running clock you're gonna have a two minute warning so it's more like the nfl game in terms of that um i think red zone defense is important i think smu is going to be able to move the ball i think that's kind of a given given how talented the offense is but if you're forcing them into threes if you can make crucial plays on crucial downs i think maybe you could keep the game a little bit closer you can maybe stick in it um for some time and i I think a fast start's going to matter because this team is you know, confident as they say they are and how much belief they say they are. Like, the last time they took the field, they got destroyed by Wyoming. Like, a lot of these guys, they don't know what success feels like. And Coach Choate said, you're only confident based on having success. They haven't had that yet. So if they get out in the first quarter and they're down by two touchdowns real quick, we saw that against Idaho, we saw that against UNLV last year, Um, basically the first play of the game for both of those, touchdowns. And that puts you on your heels and that gives you a lack of confidence. If Nevada falls into a quick hole against SMU, I think that confidence, it's just going to have to take a hit because it's going to be like, oh, like this is we're doing it again. Now, if they play the first quarter and they're within three points, they're going to start believing in themselves. They're going to start believing in what Coach Choate was preaching and that they're executing it and that they can stick in the game regardless of how big of an underdog they are. So, um, you know, it'll be if they win the coin flip, do they take the ball to try and get some confidence? I think there's a lot of interesting things to watch, but. Watching them on the sidelines and how much they believe, I think, is going to be something that is going to have to evolve and be earned with quality play. You cannot believe that you're good until you prove to yourself that you're good with good results. And the majority of these guys, I mean, all the returners, they haven't felt that. 
Now, you got some transfers in from Texas who've had mm -hmm. success, um, from other places. They're probably going to believe it right from the gates. But I think that evolves throughout the game depending upon how you're playing. So I, I think a fast start is really, really important as well. You mentioned the psychology of it because we talked to a lot of players this week and, and throughout fall camp that they mentioned, like, we want to get the taste out of our mouths with those back-to-back two, -back two and ten seasons. Um, now you integrate some of those players that come from Texas who are just was just in the college football playoff. Uh, yeah, that's just kind of an interesting, you know, mixture there of, of players that have had the ultimate conf confidence in what they've do, been doing. And then the opposite end of where players are like, oh, man, like, can we even cut it out at the FBS level because we've had such – you know, bad performances for two years now. Um, but if there's anybody in the Mountain West or any coach that can, can turn that around, you'd best believe it's probably Jeff Cho, just because he is a leader of men and uh, kind of a, a plug to you, the, the story you've written. If you guys want to learn more about Jeff Cho, uh, you had a over 5,000 word article? Yeah, almost 6,000 words. Yeah, 6,000 words. I think words. there were 11 different sections, subtitles. Uh, yeah. But yeah, I mean, I learned a lot about him and what yeah. he's been through in his life. I mean, I think he's like the perfectly crafted coach to try and resurrect Nevada, just looking at his life. So, you know, a quick synopsis. Um, his parents were from Texas, but he was born um, at Ohio State University because his parents were going to school there, mm -hmm. um, getting advanced degrees. He moved to Germany when he was one as his dad was drafted into the Vietnam War. They returned um, back home to Texas. From there, they went to Idaho. Um, his parents ended up getting divorced when he was pretty young, and then his, went with his mom, and he's got uh, three siblings. He's got one biological, uh, two biological brothers, and then a non-biological sister. His mom actually had a miscarriage, um, and then they adopted a young black daughter. And then she found out about a month later she was pregnant with who would be Jeff Cho. Mm -hmm. um, so he's got an interesting, you know, background in terms of that. They ended up settling in St. Mary's, Idaho. It's a very small town logging community, about 2,500 people. Um, he was actually living on his own his junior year of high school on. There was, uh, you know, some strife in the household. And uh, his uh, uh, parents' mom and stepdad's house was actually about 20 miles away from campus. So getting to school was a little bit difficult. So he just got a job living on his own his junior and his senior year. Goes to play at Western Montana. Um, probably could have played at a bigger school, but his grades weren't that great, uh, great like a 1.7 GPA, because he was, um, you know, going through some of that stuff. He was a, you know, very good SAT score, but ends up playing a couple years at Western Montana. Unfortunately, gets into a car accident, head-on collision, almost dies, has to be airlifted to Spokane, and actually his mom was working there at the time, about two and a half hours away from um, his house. Um, ends up, uh, you know, being able to keep his leg, almost left, lost his uh, lower half of his left leg below his knee. Um, you know, tried to train to get back to play football, blew out the knee again before the start of the next season. So mm. jumped into coaching about seven or eight years as a high school coach, um, was at a really good job at Post Falls, was the athletic director, was the football coach um, as well, and uh, ended up quitting that job and taking a $6,000 a year job at Utah State as a graduate assistant at 31 years old. Mm. Um, you know, kind of jump in that college career, built his way up, got a big break at Boise State from there, became Montana State's head coach, a lot of success with the Bobcats, got them all the way to the FCS playoffs in his fourth year, the first time the Bobcats got there since 1983. Um, didn't play during the 2020 COVID year, started getting calls from major uh, Power 5 programs about joining their staff as an assistant, accepted one at Texas, so he stepped down at Montana State. Three years with the Longhorns, helped them get to the college football playoff, then gets a call from Nevada in December, and uh, is here with the Wolfpack. So certainly blue-collar roots, um, but this is a very charismatic, um, magnetic positive motivational kind of guy um there's something his wife told me that she kind of compares him to the feather that dumbo had that kind of <laughs> made him believe that he could fly mm -hmm. um because he elevates people he lifts people he makes them believe and then he helps coach them to get to that point um you know you look at his first two years at montana state they were below 500 so it's not like it's just like that yeah and nevada is going to be great um the transfer portal maybe speeds things up a little bit but there is a process you have to go through yeah I wholeheartedly believe Jeff Cho will make Nevada at least a bowl caliber team moving forward. Can they get to the championship level? It's going to be tough. Like, it's not a great job from a facility and budget standpoint. Yeah. I know he completely believes, and Stephanie Rump, the athletic director who hires him, completely believes that's going to happen. Um, but, yeah, I mean, year one, that that's that's a big challenge. I mean, they're taking over a program that's at the low point of Nevada football history, I think. Back-to-back mm -hmm. -back two and ten seasons, you haven't seen that in 70 years here. Yeah. They lost 16 straight games. 16 of their 20 losses the last two years by double digits. A lot of them blowouts. Yeah. Um, bottom five in the nation last year in scoring offense. Defense wasn't much better. Fans not going out to Mackey Stadium. 
Like he's getting it down here yeah. and he's got to get it up here and you don't do that in one year, but how much can you elevate it in the first year? You know, he said he wants to launch. He doesn't want to rebuild. Uh, he wants to have the most improved win total in the FBS. So like, he's not being like, you know, four wins is good for us. You know, he, he wants to get this thing rolling really, really quickly. Um, but just, you know, we talked to him after basically every practice, like he is a guy you want to be around. He is a guy who motivates you. Um, he is a guy who makes you believe. So I, I think Nevada's got the right guy, and uh, we'll see where it goes from here. Uh, kind of sidebar, uh, he has a thing, uh, renovation. Yeah. Do you, do you think he, like, he, him and the wife are moving, and they're, like, they're talking, yeah, we need this renovation, need that renovation. And he's like, hold on a second. Reno's in there. Renovation. Reno. Yeah, that's what they're calling it. Renovation. Well, so his wife <laughs> likes to, like, remodel houses. So they yeah. even bought a house in Reno that she had to, like, remodel from scratch. But she's yeah. been very influential as well. Her name is Janet. Um, they've got a son, Jory, who played at Montana State under Jeff Cho, and then a daughter, JC, who's uh, going, I think, into her junior year at South Carolina. Um, but, you know, when he – they had, a, like, a great job. The Post Falls one, and, you know, they've got a house. They just had a newborn. They're building a house at Lake Coeur d'Alene, which is one of the most beautiful places in the world. Mm -hmm. And everything's fine. And Jeff Choke comes home one day, and he says, I quit. You know, he had kind of got fed up there because they built a new campus and he had to build all these athletic facilities. He was working from like 5 a.m. to midnight. Mm -hmm. And he said, you know, I want something more. I'm going to go to Utah State. I'm going to take $6,000 a year. I'm going to live in the basement of the linebackers coach. Um, Janet stayed back uh, over in Coeur d'Alene, worked for 18 months, funding the family, raising Jory right after he was born. So she sacrificed a lot because she believed in him. They met at uh, Montana Western. So, um, you know, kind of college sweethearts, although she was dating someone else when they first met and they didn't actually like start dating seriously until a few years after that. So, you know, that, that was, uh, you know, fun to get to know his backstory and yeah. what makes him him. Um, obviously, Wolf Pack, you know, fans are just going to care about wins and losses. But, um, you know, he's got a pretty proven history wherever he went. You know, he was at Boise State when they made it to the Fiesta Bowl that first time and beat Oklahoma in that great game. Mm -hmm. um, he was there for six seasons. I think they lost six games. That's pretty good. Yeah. You know, we went to Florida, went to Washington State, went to Washington, went to Texas. He's built a program at Montana State. Um, you know, Montana State the last couple of years has been – fantastic because of what he built there um, you know his senior se his last year there that 2020 team that didn't get to play because of covid might have won a national championship that had seven nfl players on the roster from an fcs school that's like player development that's what you have to have at nevada so smu is there as we look at this game saturday they've built that nevada's starting down here so yep. that that's what you're going against in game one a team that's already been built up to that level over a couple of years versus the team that's starting that process and mm -hmm. hopes to be somewhere near there in a couple of years. Yeah. I mean, it's probably not apples to apples, obviously, but uh, SMU not too long ago, probably, you know, 20 plus years uh, was in the whack, you know, whack for a minute uh, for a, a, a sip of tea, but Nevada and SMU used to, used to play a lot. Um, three and three all time. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, you can't, I mean, like the trajectory is there with with Choate. Um, obviously with SMU, the the donors there play a huge role. Obviously, Dallas comes from you know there's a lot of money in Dallas, in Dallas so um, and that plays a huge part in in uplifting a program. Uh, but as you've seen, even in the Mountain West, you like you know like a team like Air Force, it's not like they have backing and they're competitive year in year out, and uh, largely thanks to coaching and yeah. uh, you know Jeff Choate is along the same vein. Um, but are we doing game predictions? Yeah, yeah, but you typically hold out till Friday for your game yeah, prediction, right? That's fine. Yeah. If you're gonna watch the whole podcast, I'll give you my game prediction okay. every week. That's yeah, yeah. Give so give some. I to the will audience. say uh, 38 SMU, Nevada, 20. Whoa! So an 18 point loss. You, you have them the, covering. I have them covering. Wow. So okay. Nevada is actually 0 and 5 all time as a 20 plus point underdog at home in terms yeah. of against the spread. They've never mm -hmm. covered a 20 plus point line at home. They've yeah. only won, I think it is eight games total straight up as a double digit underdog. So this would be the biggest upset in school history. I'm not calling for the upset. I will say Nevada covers. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's, that's even a call there, but I like you got 38 on the, on the nose. That's what SMU averaged last year. So okay. kind of keeping where they. So 38, they, 20 yeah. is my official. Okay. What's yours? Yeah, I'll, I'll go. Uh, let's go shoot. I'll say 49, 21 
Um, but so they don't cover. They, they don't they, cover. They it don't was, cover by one. No, I can't. Forty nine points. Yeah, uh, when they play <laughs> these like really good teams, they end up like giving up a lot of points. I mean, granted, this is a different staff, different regime. But look throughout the years, like they obviously this is Nevada. This is not going up to like Oregon when they lost by like sixty. Yeah. Um, but even last year, like you know, playing USC, which uh, honestly different circumstance, obviously with Caleb Williams, but you know, like fifty, sixty spot. You know, it's just. I don't know. I could see it. Uh, it's just, yeah, it's a tough task, a tall task. But a silver lining there, if we're getting 21-20, that means we're, you know, given we're saying that the offense may be a little better than it was in years past. Yes. <laughs> I think Nevada's offense will be better, actually. Um, it can't uh, literally, well, I guess literally it can be worse. You can score them less than 17.3 points per game. Throw more interceptions. I don't think realistically it can be worse. Yeah, fair. But uh, there's our game preview, so we'll check back next week. Yeah, we uh, yeah, it should be fun Saturday. Uh, I'll be out there. You'll be at home, just uh, just watching as a great observer of CBS Sports. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it should it should be interesting. Obviously, a talented team coming to Mackey. Folks, go out there, just check it out. Obviously, it's a, it's a new new uh, new era under Jeff Cho, and obviously, you know they they're trying to drive a 25 plus beer. I don't know. There you go. You know, if you can go out there and do that, do it. Um, well, thanks for joining me, Chris. We'll be back next week, obviously, with the uh, preview of Troy, a recap of this game, and all of the above. But thanks, as always, for tuning in. Remember to like, rate, subscribe, wherever you guys get this podcast. And we'll see you guys next time.